time for the Word of God. I want to get into the Word of God today. I want to unfold some uh, complexities in the Word of God. I'm going to need your patience today. I've got something to share with you. I want to talk to you out of the Romans chapter 11, verse 1 through 5. And I believe you're going to be blessed as we talk about the loyalty of God. We're living in a time today that you can't hardly find loyalty. Not even in places you ought to have loyalty, you can't find loyalty. Not even in relationships, not even in relatives do you always find loyalty. Not with companies, not with positions, not with churches. No, 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 no. Loyalty is almost extinct. But today we're going to talk about the loyalty of God. Romans chapter 11, verse 1 through 5, when you have it, say amen. Stand for the reading of God's Word. It is our custom to stand for the reading of His Word. As we go before God in His Word, it is reverence to the fidelity and the sanctity of God's Word. I say then, hath God cast away His people? God forbid, for I also am an Israelite of the seed of Abraham, of the tribe of Benjamin. God hath not cast away his people which he foreknew. What ye not, what the scripture saith of Elias, how he maketh intercession to God against Israel, saying, Lord, they have killed thy prophets and dig down thine altars, and I am left, check this out, I am left alone, and they seek my life. But what saith the answer of God unto him? I have reserved to myself 7,000 men who have not bowed the knee to the image of Baal. Even so then, at this present time also, there is a remnant according to the election of grace. Can you say amen? Father God, in the name of Jesus, we ask you to bless the sanctity of your word. Enable these mere, fallible, frail lips of clay to articulate the oracles of truth in such a didactic and profound and prolific way that it penetrates the exterior of our carnal hearts and goes down into the depths of our deepest being. And there germinates and brings forth the character of Christ in our lives. It is our prayer that you would be glorified and that hell would be horrified as we delve into the treasures of your word. I thank you for what you're about to do in the midst of your people today. Have your way in Jesus' name. Somebody give him the best praise you got. In our text today, we have a very interesting theme because here Paul contemplates with Rome, has God forever cast away his people? The very question challenges not just the character of his people, but it teaches us the character of our God. Because the character of our God is often proven best as we explore the frailty of our own character. That is to say, the more inconsistent and frail and weaker we are, the greater he appears to us as we see him amidst the canvas of all types of infidelities, insecurities inconsistencies. It makes God look the better when everything else around you begins to shake and there's nothing solid left to stand on but God. We must then understand not just Israel but God through the declaration of this word. Hath God forever cast away his people? Has God forgotten his people? Has God gotten angry and walked away from his own? This is an opportunity to understand something about ourselves and about our God expressed through the book of Romans. Paul begins to deal with this whole theme. The gospel is the power of God for salvation for anyone who believes. He does it because he wants us to understand this letter by stating clearly the real good news is not about the emperor or the empire or what's going on in the world, but the real power for salvation comes from God, not the emperor or the empire or the strength of Rome or anything like that because the truth of the matter Rome was not going through such a good time. You're talking about the writing of this book in about 56 or 57 A.D. It's the time that Paul, the Apostle Paul, has written a letter to Rome that he has yet to visit. 
And so unlike the other epistles that he's written where he is calling a lot of names and di directing his attention to the issues of the church at Rome, he is talking to us from a much higher level and a deeper perspective as he unveils the truth of what is going on. Let me lay in context the environment in which things are, are germinating in this environment. Nero has come to power, and Nero comes to power from about uh, December 15th of, of 37 AD to June 9th of 68 AD. He was the Roman emperor ruling uh, from 54 to 68 in control of anything and everything that was going on. Rome is still considered the force to be reckoned with, the political empire of the entire planet in a class all by itself. As Nero has come into power, his infamous reign is usually associated with tyranny, extravagance, and debauchery. He, 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 he later converted to Christianity, and yet we are still suspect, even when he converted, was he legitimately a Christian, or was it a political play for the times in which he lived? That in part is brought about by the fact that on June 9th of 68 AD, Nero killed himself. So you have this leader who comes into power and influence at about 17 years old. And at about 17 years old, with his mother's guidance, he is able to rule over the Roman Empire uh, with authority, great authority. But five years later, he killed his own mother. He was a ruthless tyrant, and he was ruling over a group of people who had a lot of different religions and a lot of different ideas and a lot of different theological connotations. And it is in this environment that Paul is writing to them. The seed of religious power has begun to make a transition. So now I'm talking about the transition because I want you to understand not only the times, I talked to you about the times, now I'm gonna to talk to you about the transition. To go from the times to understand the times that the text was written in helps you to understand the text itself. If you take a text that was written for a period of time that was up under the rule of Nero and you contemporize it without understanding that what was going on at the times really controls the impact of the text itself, then you begin to understand that there is a transition going on. So point one is the times. Point two is the transition. Transition? What transition? The seat of spiritual influence has begun to move from Jerusalem to Rome. It is moving largely because the Jews are, for the most part, rejecting Christianity as, as a legitimate theology, and they're finding a home amongst the Gentiles that they did not have uh, amongst the Jews. And so even though Jerusalem is still the motherland of our faith, it is the grandmother of our heritage. It is the roots in which our faith is extrapolated from. Yet the early days of Christianity moved and transitioned from Jerusalem as a head to Rome. Hence you have the Roman Catholic Church and all of the various Orthodox uh, religions of that first century begin to flourish largely out of Rome. When Paul writes to Rome, it is his biggest writing. It is his longest writing because he is writing to what is and not what was. Jerusalem has for the most part turned its back on the idea of Christ being the Messiah except for a remnant in Jerusalem and a remnant of Jews scattered throughout the diaspora who embrace Christianity. The vast majority of Judaism has turned its back on the notion of Christ being a legitimate Messiah. So the seat of religious power now has come to Rome. Constantine's mother, who would later come along, she is responsible for the spread of Christianity, history says, because she is purportedly the one who actually found the cross. And rather than to have people fighting over it, broke it down into splinters and sent pieces of it all over the world. And each part of the world that got a hold to a piece of the cross caused the gospel to spread across the world in an unprecedented way. God has a way of using some of the most unorthodox people to, to get done what he's trying to get done. He's trying to create a transition, and it's a transition not only of the seat of power, but the influence of that power, because Christianity was initially considered a cult. 
but out of the ground of that cult came such a powerful move of the Holy Spirit that you could not deny that it was sweeping the world and could not be stopped by scribes nor scholars. Uh, nor statisticians or historians. It had caught on fire and God used this one woman to help spread the gospel and it was going everywhere, but the power started out of Rome and what Rome was starting to understand uh, the Christian faith. So Paul here is an apostle, not just to the Jew, but the Gentile. His question in the text, however, is, he's saddened by the fact that his people for the most part have turned away. They have turned their backs on God and gone in other directions and sought God as he was and not as he is. And Paul is saying, has God forever forgotten his people Israel? Are we cursed? Are we up under a bondage? It is to this issue that he addresses the longevity of the fact that God will stand with you through changes. Now it's important that we understand that because we need to understand that God is right when we are wrong that God is strong when we are weak, that God is there when we are stray. And it is only the integrity of God that establishes our faith. Our faith is not built on a man. Our faith is not built on a preacher. Our faith is not built on a building. Our faith is not built on a denomination. Our faith is built on the integrity of God. And that integrity includes a loyalty a loyalty so strong that it is beyond human comprehension and it is about that loyalty that we're preaching about today. And it's hard to preach about something for which there is no metaphor. When Jesus comes and preaches the kingdom, he keeps saying the kingdom is likened unto this and the kingdom is likened unto that and the kingdom is likened unto that. But when it comes to the loyalty of God, I'm, I'm unable to find a metaphor that rightly depicts the strength and the power of the loyalty of God. What can I say about the loyalty? The only, only thing I can think of to say is that God kept his promise to Abraham when Abraham was dead. Abraham was dead and for 400 years, Israel was enslaved in Egypt and God still brought Israel out of enslavement from Egypt because he had given his word to a dead man. You have a God that says that I'm not a man that I should lie or the son of man that I should repent. Have I not spoken it? Will I not make it good? And the reason I'm sharing it with you today, because just as turbulent as the times were in Rome, just as indecisive as the times were in Rome, that same indecisiveness exists today in our country and other countries around the world where you don't know from day to day what's gonna happen. This one fighting against that one. In fact, Rome was on the brink of civil war, a civil war where there would be fighting between traditional Jews and the Roman Empire that almost split the country. And now in a tribal time in our country where everybody's mad at everybody and everybody's fighting about everything and everybody's at war with everybody else and everybody, it's one thing to disagree, but now we hate people that are not on our team, that are not on our side. And if you wonder if we're not going to run into what Rome ran into. Internal corruption ended up destroying the Roman Empire. And when I look at America today, I wanna to talk directly to America today, you're on the brink of total destruction, not because we have disagreements, but because we have disloyalty and disjointedness and because we have divided and a house divided against itself shall not stand. It is in the midst of that division that God sends a word. I love God because God doesn't need a perfect situation to send a perfect word. He'll send a word into a chaotic situation. He'll remind you that he's still God in the midst of it all. And I wanted you to understand that Rome was going through what America is going through, what other countries around the world are going through, anarchy and deceitfulness and betrayal and denials and uncertainty. And every day you woke up in Rome, you didn't know what was going to happen next. And still in the midst of all of that, God was still faithful. He had not cast away his people, even when his people cast him away. For the Bible said that Jesus came unto his own and his own received him not. But in spite of the fact that they did not receive him, God still had a commitment to be loyal to them. In fact, one writer says that God is married to the backslider. 
I want to talk to somebody who's drifted away or turned your back on God or gone into another direction. And now you're guilty and full of shame and you've done some things of which you are ashamed of. You've had an abortion. You've had a baby out of wedlock. You've gone this way or that way into perversion or idolatry or other religions. I want you to know that God is still right where you left off and you have unfinished business with God. This text is about unfinished business with God, that God is not slack concerning his promise as some men count slackness. He's still waiting on you to come to yourself and that God has not forever cast you away. I know the devil wants to tell you that God has cast you away. I know the devil wants you to feel hopeless so that you have an excuse to go further and further into your own degradation, but the devil is a liar. God is still right where you left him. Ask the prodigal son if the father won't outweigh you. He'll stand right where he stood and say, you're still my son and I still love you and I'm right where you left me and if you come to yourself, I'll bring you up out of the muck and the mire. I want to speak to America and say if we just come to ourselves, God is waiting on us to come to ourselves and understand who we are so that we can begin to stand in the power and the grace and the anointing of God. I am the Lord thy God. I change not. I change not. My mercies are new every morning. I'm consistent. I'm stable. Your mama is shaky, but I'm stable. Your father is shaky, but I'm stable. Your husband is shaky, but I'm stable. Your wife is shaky, but I'm stable. Your job is shaky, but I'm stable. Your finances are shaky, but I'm stable. The stock market is shaky, but I'm stable. Your friends are shaky, but I'm stable. I'm God. I'm a rock. I'm a rock. I'm a stone. I'm a sure place. I'm an absolute in a chaotic world. I do not have Alzheimer's. I have not forgotten you. I know you. I know you. You think it's about you knowing me. No, it's not about you knowing me. It's about me knowing you. I know you. In fact, I knew you. The text says I foreknew you. God has not forgotten those he foreknew. Nothing about the times, nothing about the world, nothing about the violence, nothing about the chaos, nothing about the plagues, nothing about the diseases, nothing about the presidency, nothing about the leadership, nothing about the election, nothing about the nation has caused God to forget who you are to him. By the way, our nation is not of this world. Our kingdom is not of this world. Our king is not of this world. We have a king. His name is Jesus and he said I'm still here the same yesterday today and forevermore I am the Lord thy God I change not I'm gonna say that again I am the Lord thy God I change not I am the Lord thy God I change not Lord that's good news that's good news when you live in a world where you don't know, you meet the same person you met on Monday and wonder Wednesday, is that the same person? The person who promised you love on Wednesday has got your divorce papers on Tuesday. You don't know what's gonna happen from day to day. The company who said they appreciated you let you go next week, you don't know what's going on. God said, I'm not like any of them. I have not forgotten you because I foreknew you. I foreknew you like Jesus foreknew John before he met him in the Jordan River. He had met him in his mother's womb. The babies had leaped when the women had kissed. They were filled with the Holy Ghost. God said, your relationship with me did not start with your birthday. I foreknew you. Before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee, I ordained thee, and I sanctified thee to be a prophet unto the nation. I am your God, not your buddy. I am your God, not your friend. I am your God, not your daddy. I'm not a deadbeat dad. I'm not somebody that will reject you. I'm not a woman who didn't want to have a baby. I will not abort my promise concerning you. I am your God, and I'm in it when you're out of it. And I'm standing here when you fail. And I'm strong when you're weak. And I'm healing when you're sick, and I'm life when you're dead, and I'm peace when you're confused. I'm God! I change not. This point in the text, he begins to teach the people of God to understand from a 40,000 foot view 
that God has a plan for his people. And he weaves throughout the book of Romans the plan of God, talking first about the Gentiles and then about the Jews, weaving it together. And about chapter three, three or four, he concludes them all in unbelief and makes both the Jew and the Gentile come into one door. And that is the door of faith. Why do we come to God by faith? Because if we came by facts, we'd have to have intelligence in order to come. He had to fix the door where the illiterate and the intellectual would come through the same door. I'm proud of your degrees. I'm proud of your accomplishments. I'm proud of the many accolades that have been bestowed upon you. But you don't get to God because you're smart. You get to God because you believe. And if you believe God, it is counted under you as righteousness. If you're going to impress God, it's not your money that impresses God, it's your faith. Without your faith, it is impossible to please God. That's the text we have before us today. That's the text we have before us. The common denominator that brings both the Jew and the Gentile rushing through the same door. There is therefore now no condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus who walk no longer after the flesh but after the spirit. That's the God that we're talking about right now. That's the God that's before us in this text who's faithful when you are foolish. I said he is faithful when you are foolish. I know you need to act like you've never been foolish, but the truth of the matter, there's not a person listening at me right now who has not been foolish and walked in your own way and walked away from God and did your own thing and had to come stumbling back to the cross asking God for mercy, and he was right where you left him. He was there all the time. He was there in your pain and in your suffering and in your agony. God has not forgotten his people. Say that with me. God has not forgotten his people. Say it again. God has not forgotten his people. Say it again. God has not forgotten his people. Say it again. God has not forgotten his people. Say it again. God has not forgotten his people. I have to tell you, this blesses me. I don't know what it does for you, but it blesses me because I admit sometimes I feel forgotten. I feel forgotten by everybody and everything. I've helped people who forgot. I've loaned money to people who forgot. I've comforted people who forgot. I stood by people who forgot. I opened doors for people who forgot. And I have to admit that sometimes it just gives me comfort to know that God has not forgotten me. God has not forgotten. The Bible said God is not unjust to forget your labor of love and that you have ministered to the saints and do minister, that God remembers when other people forget. God has not forgotten. You know why? God is loyal. God is loyal. God is consistent. We're talking about the loyalty of God. And the reason I'm ministering the loyalty of God is because I'm ministering the loyalty of God in an atmosphere of total feelings of abandonment. I have never seen a year like 2020 that has challenged us more deeply down to the core of our existence. We feel abandoned by truth, abandoned by justice, abandoned by mercy, abandoned by leadership, abandoned by families and friends, and the feeling of abandonment is pervasive. Now, excuse me if you don't get blessed, because if you never felt abandoned, then loyalty doesn't mean much. But if you've ever been abandoned, it's helpful to understand that God is saying, I will not do you like they did. I will not leave you like they did. I will not forget you like they did. I will not abuse you like they did. I will not forsake you like they did. God is saying, I will not treat you like you treat me. I will not abandon you in spite of how you feel, in spite of your circumstance, in spite of your economy, in spite of your politics, in spite of your government, in spite of your world, in spite of the chaos of the times, God says, I'm still here in the pandemic with you, in the fiery furnace with you. 
I'm right there with you in the unemployment line. I'm with you. In the hospital, I'm with you. In despair, I'm with you. In feeling forsaken, I'm still with you. God is saying, I am still with you. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call ye upon him while he's yet near. Let the wicked forsake his ways and the unrighteous man his thoughts. I am not like your father. I will not abandon you. I will comfort you as a hen gathers her eggs. I will comfort you. I'm fighting against the feeling of abandonment. Every time you see somebody shot down, you feel abandoned. Every time you see the wrong person adjudicated and dismissed from being apprehended and seeing justice not work, it makes you feel abandoned. Every time you can't get in the grocery store and buy what you need and you have to watch everybody else getting what they want, you feel abandoned. Every time justice walks past your house, you feel abandoned. Every time people look over top of you as if you're not a person, you feel abandoned. God said, I'm not like them. I will not abandon you. Oh, somebody type, God is loyal. God is loyal with you in the storm and in the test and in the trial. And God says, you cannot afford to walk in your feelings. You cannot afford to walk in your emotions. You cannot afford to walk in your abandonment. You cannot afford to walk in your childhood. You cannot afford to walk in your trauma. You cannot afford to walk in your strife. God is loyalty. We are talking about the loyalty of God. Then the writer goes further and he starts giving the example of Elijah who has the feeling of abandonment, not because he's not anointed. You can be anointed and still feel abandoned. Elijah is anointed. He called down fire on Mount Carmel. He called down fire on Mount Carmel. He overcame all the prophets of Baal. He rose up against him. He called down fire, swallowed up 450 prophets of Baal and turned around and ran like a little girl because you can be anointed and still feel abandoned. And he said, I'm running, not just because I'm afraid of Jezebel. I'm running, not just because I'm worried about Ahab. I'm running because I feel alone. And I wanna to talk to some people who feel alone, alone in your house, alone in your apartment, alone by yourself, alone in your marriage. Yeah, you can be married and still be alone, alone in your ministry, alone in your faith, and you feel abandoned and forsaken, and you're by yourself. That's what made Elijah run, and that's why Paul brings him up in the text. Elijah was running from a feeling. It wasn't just a woman. He said, I'm running because I'm alone and I'm by myself. I killed the prophets. I got the victory. But what good is victory if I'm abandoned? I want to talk to people who have great victory and you feel guilty because you're not enjoying your victory because you feel abandoned and you feel forsaken and you thought victory would be better and you got the job and you got the house and you got the car and you've forgotten how blessed you are because none of it brought you the joy that you thought it was going to bring you. And there you begin to recognize the house is just a bill and the car is just a note to be paid. And all of a sudden you've got all of this stuff, but you're wondering why you're running. You're running because you feel alone. And Elijah was feeling alone. And he gets up under the juniper tree and he says, I am alone. I'm anointed, but I'm alone. I'm gifted, but I'm alone. I'm, I'm powerful, but I'm by myself. There are none left but me. I am by myself. And God says to him, are you crazy? I've got 7,000 that have not bowed to Baal nor kissed the nasty image. I got people you never met yet. I got doors in front of you that you haven't even seen yet. I got blessings you haven't even touched yet. I got revelations you haven't even seen yet. I got power you haven't even touched yet. I got victory you haven't even laid hands. Don't you know I am God? I'm still God. I'm God in the face of Ahab. I'm God in the face of Jezebel. I'm God in the face of Rome. I'm God in the face of America. I'm God in the unemployment line. I'm God in the hospital. 
glory. I'm God in a time of trouble. I'm God in a time of agony. I'm God in your affliction. I'm God in your divorce. I'm God in your crisis. I am God. I'm not your boyfriend. I'm God. I'm not your girlfriend. I'm God. Oh, God, you don't hear me. I feel the anointing. <laughs> I feel the anointing of the Holy Ghost. We're talking about the loyalty of God. And we're weighing it against the feelings of men. And the feelings of men says, I am alone. And I am abandoned. And I am forsaken. And I am here by myself. And the loyalty of God says, that is a lie. I've got resources you haven't touched yet. And to somebody listening at me right now, I'm calling on a revolution in your mind to stop coming to God talking about how you feel and start talking to God about who he is. Stop going to God and talking about, I feel like quitting. I feel like giving up. I feel like walking away. I don't feel appreciated. I don't feel, this is, the, you don't come to God by feelings. You come to God by faith. And in order to have faith, you got to start talking God talk. You can't be talking man talk. You got to talk God talk. You can't be telling God what's wrong. God already knows what's wrong. If you're going to come to him, you got to come by faith. Stop whining to God. God is not your therapist. God is not your counselor. God will not know when you were potty trained. He doesn't need to know when you were potty trained. You don't need to bring your doubt, bring your faith. God, I thank you, you're loyal. God, I thank you, you're faithful. God, I thank you, you're consistent. God, I thank you, you're able. God, I thank you, you got power. God, I thank you, you got mercy. God, I know who you are. I may not see him, but I know you got help. I know you got prophets. I know you got help. I know you got resources. God said, I've got 7,000 prophets, man, that you have not even seen. I want to close talking to you about what you have not seen. You keep praying about what you see and God keeps talking about what you don't see. Elijah is running because of what he sees. God is talking to him about what you, you don't see. I've got 7,000 prophets that have not bowed to Baal nor kissed the nasty image. You are not in this thing by yourself. I got help you haven't touched yet. I've got resources you haven't built into. God wants to talk to you about the unseen. The Bible said, your eyes have not seen, your ears have not heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things that God has in store for them that love him. If you're going to climb out of this ditch, you're going to climb climb out in the unseen. Some of y'all are trying to climb out in what you see. You'll never get out of it talking about what you see. You got to climb out of that ditch in what you don't see. I know you got blessings I haven't seen yet. I know you got doors that are about to open in my life. I know you got blessings I haven't tapped into yet. I know you got things ahead of me that's greater than what's behind me. I know my tomorrow is better than my day. I know my latter end is greater than my beginning. I know that greater is the end of a thing than the beginning of a thing. God wants to talk to you about what's next, not what was, not what used to be, not even what is. God wants to talk to you about what's next. In my text today, God is challenging you to open your heart and open your mind and open your spirit beyond how you feel and beyond what you see and beyond feeling abandoned and beyond feeling rejected and beyond feeling scared, and beyond feeling uncertain, if you're gonna climb out of this ditch, I'm gonna give you a rope to climb out of this ditch. Get your hands on the rope. You never see anybody climbing up a rope, looking down. Whenever people are climbing up a rope, they're always looking up. And God said, you've been down in the pit too long but I'm getting ready to throw you a rope this Sunday and you're climbing out by this rope. And in order to climb up this rope, you gotta start looking up. You gotta start looking at tomorrow. You gotta start to understand what your eyes have not seen and your ears have not heard. You gotta start counting money that hadn't come yet. You gotta start walking in health you don't feel yet. You gotta start walking in wisdom you haven't realized yet. Y'all oh, don't hear what I'm saying? God! Oh, 
God, God is he's faithful. He's consistent. He's loyal. He's immutable. He's everlasting. He's eternal. He's God. He's wonderful. He's a counselor. He's a mighty God. He's the Prince of Peace. He's the everlasting Father. He's the kinsman. He's a redeemer. He's a day star. He's a trumpet. He's a shield. He's a buckler. Excuse me. He's the lily of the valley. I thought I'd pick him up. He's a bright and morning star. He's my hope in the middle of hopelessness. He's my joy in the middle of sorrow. He's my peace in the middle of confusion. God is the joy and the strength of my life. He moves all pain, misery, and strife. The faithfulness of God. The problem in our world, ha, my God, I feel it. The problem in our world today is we have raised a generation of people who know church, but they don't know God. They know church. They know when to raise their hand. They know when to wear white. They know when to put on skinny jeans. They know when to be slain in the spirit. They know how to fall back. You know church, but the test is on that you might know God. You'll never have power just knowing church. You'll never have glory just knowing church. You'll never have deliverance just knowing church. You'll never have a breakthrough just knowing church. Oh my God, I feel holy. You'll never have a breakthrough just knowing church. But I dare you this morning to get down on your knees like your grandmother did and start calling on the name of Jesus. Oh, that I may know you in the fellowship of your suffering and the power of your oh, that I may. I'm talking to you about the loyalty of God because he foreknew you. Nothing that you have gone through has shocked him. Wait a minute. He foreknew you. Nothing that you have gone through has shocked him. <laughs> Nothing that you've discovered about yourself has shocked him. Nothing that you hold secret about yourself has shocked him. The text says, he foreknew you. God does not forget those he foreknew. The Bible says in the last days, many shall come and say, I did great works in your name. I heal the sick in your name. I raised the dead in your name. And he said, depart from me, ye workers of iniquity. Not you didn't know me. He says, I never knew you. I'm happy this morning because he knows me. I am known of God. My wife is learning me. My God knows me. My children are learning me. My God knows me. I'm learning me. My God knows me. I am known of God. When the pandemic first hit, <laughs> my wife and I were talking and I said, you wanna get some takeout? And she said, no, I don't want no takeout. I said, why not? I said, people are, the restaurants are all switching to takeout and you can, get an app and you can just get some takeout. She said, no, if I cook it, I know what's in it. <laughs> and she said, right now, because of the times we're living in, I, I need to be sure what's in what I'm putting in my mouth. 
God knows you like my wife knows what's in her recipe. Because he was there when you were stirred up. And as time and heat and life and processing and refrigeration brings things out of you that you didn't know were in you, God already knew they were in you. In another place, Paul says, those he did foreknow, he did predestine. And those he predestined, he called. And those he called, he justified. And those he justified, he glorified. Lift your hands right where you are. Forget about what you got on and who's around you. And when you raise your hands, there's an openness and a vulnerability when you raise your hands and lift them. And know that everything from the crown of your head to the soles of your feet, God's already searched you. He's already known you. There's not anything in you, not a pinch, not a dab of anything that he doesn't know. The Bible says all things are open before him with whom we have to do. So when God says, I will not forsake you. You don't have to worry about him discovering something to say, oh, I didn't know that was there. <laughs> I, I didn't mean that part right there. He knows you. He's with you. One of my favorite hymns is Great is Thy Faithfulness. And the reason I love the hymn I cannot say over the 43 years of my ministry that I've always been faithful to God. But I promise you, He's been faithful to me. Whether you're watching me in a prison cell or a hospital room, whether you're in a penthouse suite or a jail block, God's been faithful. Whether you hire people or you're unemployed. Whether you're running a company or lost a company. God's been faithful. Now everybody will be with you when you're up. But God will be loyal to you in a down season. And it's just a season. You hear that? It's just a season. He'll be loyal to you all the way. This Sunday morning, God asked me to remind you that he's loyal. That you might be delayed, but you're not denied that God has not forgotten all those that are truly His. And if you are His this morning, as the old folks say, He may not come when you want Him, but He's right on time. What do you say to the loyalty of God? If you're grateful for it this morning, if you realize it this morning, if you taste it this morning, if you sense it this morning, turn that kitchen into a church. Turn that bedroom into a storefront and open your mouth and give God praise and give him glory and bless his name. Great is thy faithfulness. Great is thy faithfulness. 
People will come and people will go. Seasons will come and they will go. But if you want to be left standing when all this craziness is over, give him the glory right where you are, tap into his loyalty and start bragging about how faithful he is. When people ask you how you are, tell them God's faithful. He'll meet you right where you are. I want you to play that for me one more time. And I want you to think about how loyal God has been. to Marcus Dawson, all I have needed, thy hands have provided. I want to pray for needs this morning. We've talked about the loyalty of God. We've talked about those moments when you feel abandoned. We've talked about those moments when the systems of this world around you begin to cave and quake and shake and break. And you wonder, where is God? I want to pray for the needs that drive an Elijah to a juniper tree. <laughs> I want to talk, I want to pray for the people who are so powerful over here, call down fire from heaven over here, and so weak over there. And everybody calls on you because you call fire down from heaven. But when you're up under the juniper tree, nobody's there and you're there all by yourself. I want to pray for people who feel abandoned. Father, right now, These are your children. Their needs are your needs. Their pains are your pains. Their burdens are your burdens. They come to you with their hands raised and their hearts open. Just as surely as you fed Elijah, feed them this morning. If you have to bring it through a raven, feed them this morning and strengthen your people. Great God that you are. Let your power and your glory saturate your people today in the supernatural name of Jesus. I thank you in advance for what you're about to do in the hearts and the lives of your people who have come to a breaking point and a falling point and a stumbling point and a weeping point and a wrestling point and they need you, they need, they need you, 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 they need you. Some can't get over the grief. <laughs> Some can't get over the pain. Some can't get over it. They're trying, they can't get over it. Oh God. 
oh God. Let strength rise up like an artesian well. Let peace spring up out of their belly. Let living waters saturate their soul. Let new realms of peace come into their spirit. I pray in Jesus' name that they would never be the same again. Press down. Press down, shaking together. As I close this prayer, I just want to thank you for being the God of the shipwreck, to being the God of the broken heart, for being married to the backslider. I just want to thank you for riding on the boat when the boat is filled with water. <laughs> How? Let me thank you, Jesus, for being God in a hospital room, God in a nursing home, God in a crisis center, God in a halfway house, God in the time of my affliction, God in AA, God in recovery rooms. I want to thank you, Lord, for your loyalty. You never left me. You never forsook me. And I believe you for it today. Now, Lord, as we come to the close of this service, let your anointing abide with us. Let your peace and power saturate us. Let us go through the rest of our day whispering to you, driving down the road talking to you. <laughs> While we're doing our laundry, let us keep talking to you because everywhere we go and everywhere we be, you're right there in the midst of us. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory well without end. In the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. And amen. Put your hands together and give the Lord a praise. Thank Him for today. Thank Him for today. Thank Him for today. Thank Him for His loyalty. Thank Him for His patience. Thank Him for His mercy. Thank Him for His kindness. We love you. We're praying for you. May God be with you till we meet again. In Jesus' name, take care.